And I think we are live on air. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. This is A World for Change with Wayne Meter. I'm Tracy Baker with Healthy You. And we're going to just throw it right to Wayne because he's got a lot to tell you about wicking baskets. So there you go, Wayne. You're open. Yeah. Hi, my name's Wayne Metter with the World for Change TV. I'm not so certain that I have a lot to tell you, but I think our guest has more to tell you, and that our guest is Rob Bob. Uh, and if any of you who watch my personal YouTube channel, and uh, if you're affiliated with the gardening community at all on YouTube, then you probably know who Rob Bob is. He has uh, he lives down in Queensland, Australia, and does a, a lot of um, a very unique gardening in his backyard, and you can learn a lot from his personal YouTube channel as well. Uh, and I'm just going to turn it over to you, Rob. Uh, um, I'd like to hear a little bit about yourself and give you a chance to tell everybody how to get in touch with you and how to follow you, and then we're going to jump into our topic of interest today. So go ahead, Rob. Not a problem. Morning, guys. Hope everyone's well. Yeah, um, I'm Rob. Uh, we live in Queensland, southeast Queensland, Australia. Uh, we're pretty much all trying to set up a bit of an urban farm in the backyard. Uh, we do a lot of uh, gardening using the wicking system, pretty much all the garden beds. It was, it was pretty much all uh, out of necessity during drought years here. We started gardening, do a bit of aquaponics, aquaculture, also have a couple of chooks running around the back, chickens, sorry, running around the backyards, and we keep a fair few worms as well. So, yeah, we try, we're trying to cover all bases and make as much as we can to feed the soil and ourselves. So... Right. That's a bit about us and what we do. Okay, very good. And um, thanks, Rob. And I'm here with Dan, Dan from Go for Green Living. And um, we're on site in Alabama, uh, where their, their local community is at, and uh, they're building a local community. So um, if you want to talk a little bit about yourself, then that's fine, and then we'll keep going. Okay. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here to, to my homestead. Uh, not complete, but uh, thanks to people like Rob Bob, it's getting there quicker. I have wicking beds everywhere, all over the place, and uh, I've seen just about every one of your videos, Rob, and it's an honor. So, uh, thank you. Okay, good. So, um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about wicking beds, and, and we have Rob on because, um, Rob, you can maybe give us a little direction into how you learned about wicking beds and how you started using them, but um, to my knowledge, you're the first one to start broadcasting it uh, publicly. Uh, to the extent that you are, and I think you've helped to make them more of a popular gardening technique. So if you don't mind talking about that a little bit um, and some of the benefits to it, then, uh, then after you get done with that, we'll take some questions if any of the audience wants to jump in and ask some questions. So go ahead, Rob. Not a problem. Well, um, we first stumbled upon wicking gardens when we were looking for water-wise ways to garden here. Uh, we had a pretty severe drought. Actually, we have quite a few here in Australia. Um, and we had water restrictions. We were only allowed to water our gardens one day uh, a week for an hour or two. So what we pretty much all did was we started looking for water-wise ways to garden, came across Colin Austin and his website. He's the guy who sort of popularized and came up with the idea of wicking beds and wicking gardens. Mm -hmm. And we pretty much all ran from it from there, uh, ran with it from there. Um, what some of the benefits I see in it is number one, saving water. Um, it gets very hot down here. Uh, we get up to 40 degrees centigrade, about 100 and something over there Fahrenheit, um, and we get a lot of lot of problems trying to keep plants hydrated during those really hot summers. So yeah. the the wicking gardens we we see next to no wilt. Seriously, next to no wilt um, in most crops. Some things like vines, you know, a large plant like that you're always going to get a little bit of wilt. Um, one of the big benefits for us water-wise is we only have to go out there once a week and basically water the garden. Uh, that's, you know, when when we were a little bit busier in our lifestyle, that was a great benefit. Um, winter, we're now in winter. I can get away with anywhere up to two to three weeks without having to water, um, depending on the crops that are in the beds as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and one, one of the big benefits I really like about these things is they're a self-contained ecosystem. You, you can basically add in your, um, your worms and some scraps, some manure, something for them to eat, uh, to break down, decompose, to get bacteria on for the worms to eat, and they'll continually fertilize your beds, um, keeping them nice and nutrient-dense uh, for the plants. 
I, I just think they're an all-round fantastic idea. Uh, so I've seen people build feeding stations. Colin Austin has feeding stations in his. Um, yeah. But yeah, we, we pretty much all run with the idea of you dig a bit of manure through, and the, you know you're going to keep your worms happy. Throw a bit of compost on top. So yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so as far as the the amount of water that it takes, do you have any idea uh, the percentage that you save or the compared to regular conventional water? With with, um, with the large original wicking beds, no, I don't. Um, the the drainage in them isn't that spot on, so it takes a while. The beds may be full and overflowing down the sides before it runs out the little drainage hole that shows me they're full. With the new IBCs out the front, though, uh, the way I've set them up, the water flows as soon as they're full. It runs through the overflow. We had, give you some idea, I don't know the exact literage. Um, I would I would guess it's around about 60 litres. I'm not sure what that is in gallons. Okay. Okay. Um, but it holds about 60 litres, the ones out the front there. We had um, Aztec corn in one. I don't know if you saw um, those guys. We yep. had about, I think there was close to 40 plants, and they were sucking them dry in a day and a half. But then in the bed right next to it, uh, we had um, other bits and pieces, and they were pretty much, well, you know, goes a week. So that 60 litres would last us a week, zero, next to zero evaporation, nice mulch layer on top. So it, it depends on what sort of plants. But, yeah, roughly about 60 litres for an IBC one, I suppose, is the answer. <laughs> okay. okay, yeah, good. So, um, Tracy, if we have any questions that uh, the audience is, is typing out there, great. We want to bring them up, and then if not, we'll jump right into it and get started with building the wicking beds. Are you there, Tracy? I can't hear you. But um, So we're going to go ahead and start building the wicking beds, unless you uh, maybe your mic's muted and you can come in and let me know that in a bit, Tracy. Um, but, uh, Rob, can you hear me? I certainly can, sir. Okay, good. So why don't you go ahead and tell us the, the principle about uh, what wicking beds are, how they work, and maybe we can demonstrate a little bit by holding up some of the items and talk about the process, and uh, we'll start to build it through this um, chat. Not a problem. Well, from, from the bottom up, um, basically you need a container, a watertight container uh, or an arrangement. Um, we're talking barrels, so a barrel will do basically a watertight barrel and what you need to do is set up a reservoir area in the base. So there's various ways you can do that. Um, some people use rocks, fill them up with rocks. Some people, uh, very smart people, use timber or wood, um, sand to hold water, um, or the ag pipe, uh, like I know Wayne's about to hold up. Um, that basically gives somewhere for the water to uh, somewhere for the water to sit and basically be available to the plants. The water wicks up, I use sand in ours, um, wicks up through layers of sand into the soil and then basically it's a free-for-all for the, the roots and the worms um, to have it the moisture. Uh, another thing too is um, plants roots grow down and one thing I found with a lot of my barrels, I've had some very deep ones, um, mm -hmm. the plants roots will actually take up the reservoir. Um, something that a lot of people don't think about, but the, the plants will actually go down and search for water. So you can actually have quite deep wicking barrels or wicking beds even, as long as you hydrate the plant long enough through watering on the top for the roots to go down and find that reservoir area or the damp sweet spot, I suppose. Okay. Um, so maybe, and, and help me remember if we need to, towards the end of this, we can talk about what it's like to, to uh, at the end of the season, to pull your plants out and to try to clean yep. it up and get it ready for the next year. Yeah. Because I know that that's a question for me right now is if the roots are in the water reservoir, then how do we deal with that? So yeah, uh, that's something maybe we can come up with here in a bit. But um, Not a problem. Tracy, do we have you back now? You do. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> um, we've got lots of people out there in... Um, for some reason, Comment Tracker is not pulling the stream off the live feed. It's pulling from all the shares only. So I'm mucking back and forth with it. But Richard Dixon, uh, I'm sorry, Richard Clarkson asks, 60 liters is about 15 to 16 gallons? And that's a question mark. 
And um, Cheryl Lowe's just saying this is a Desert Dwellers dream show. <laughs> and uh, Leela, I hope I'm blue boxing better now. Tell me and let me know. And we've got Alabama Organic, Organic Gardening just so excited about Rob the Thunder from Down Under, is what he called you. So, <laughs> so that's a little touch and check in, and, and we'll, we'll keep working on getting Comment Tracker up and running for me. Okay, and for the audience, I didn't mention this at the beginning of the show, and this may help you a little bit, uh, Tracy, but if you all want to use the hashtag AW4CLive, we're trying to track that hashtag and pull it into the comments tracker. Make sure your uh, questions get answered. And that might help some of our challenge with what Tracy's dealing with right now. So when you're commenting, make sure you use AW4C Live as your hashtag, and we'll track that. All right, Rob, so uh, back to the, the design. What we're saying here is that we have the base, we have a water reservoir, and this acts as a water reservoir. We fill it up with sand, and then we uh, put some kind of a, a layer to keep the dirt that we're putting on top of the sand from mixing, and then we fill in our, our dirt and, our, and plant our plants, correct? That's that's correct. Uh, one one thing to keep in mind, I was trying to uh, prevent the sand from filling up that little reservoir donut. So I like to put a little bit of cloth over the top. Um, yeah. I got some right here. Not a problem. Yep. I, I, I haven't had. I have pulled one out that that was pretty full, but yeah, that was my own mistake. When the first builds always stuff up. So. Okay. So if yeah. we use cloth like that, is there a necessary or a reason that we're going to need to um, use a straw, or, or like in your case, you use cane? Um, no, not at all. Uh, for me, it was just um, financial. Sugar cane's cheaper than shade cloth when it came down to it. And then yeah. when I noticed that um, a couple of my first barrels had ginger, turmeric, and gallangal in them, and I made them incorrectly and I had to pull them apart. But what I noticed was after about uh, two or three months, um, the sugar cane had compressed. You can use hay, you can use straw. I just use sugar cane because that's what we got. Yeah, compressed right. into a layer and prevented any of the soil going through into the um, into the sand. And then I pulled I pulled down um, beds after 12 18 months, and there's been that perfect like layer of sugar cane mulch filled yeah. with compost worms and no soil below that layer. So I just figured it, it worked really, really well, uh, a lot better than shade cloth, a lot cheaper. So, yeah, I just keep running with it. So maybe we should use straw. Yeah, I got them right here. Yeah, so. so we have some straw. We brought some straw over over here and shade cloth just in case, you know, you had a better recommendation. Yep. Shade cloth. So. No problem. So we already have this thing cut up um, or, or uh, cut in a circle to fit in our, in our uh, wicking bed. And then, Dan, before the show, we took the drill bit. And, and this tile it was not the perforated tile, so if you can get the perforated tile, that's better. Mm -hmm. But since it wasn't, uh, Dan used a drill bit, put a bunch of holes in this, um, a hacksaw in some of the some of the places, and that should be fine. Do you think that'll work, Rob? Yeah, yeah, no, fantastic. Okay. I've done All it right. myself. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, we're not too far off. Then. Um, and Tracy, let me know if you want to go over here to camera one um, that I'm pointing back at right now, uh, let us know and we'll focus in on that. You just tell me where you want to be, where where the work's going, because in camera one right now, I don't have the bucket that uh, Dan is working on. Okay. Let's move so it over a little closer. That way, uh, hopefully, we can get that. And if I need to move the camera down, then I will. Uh, pull it a little closer to your wheelbarrow of dirt, Wayne. Okay, that's as close as I can get, but I can pull it down. No, no, pull the bucket, sir. Oh, oh. this. <laughs> like that? It, that's perfect. Now everything is framed up. You can build it right in there. The, the folks outside can see that perfect. Okay, good. Now, as soon as you put the, the pipe in there, Rob, don't you cover it up with the, the to keep the sand from getting in it? With a, yep, with a, yep, straight away. Yep. Before you put the sand, right? Yeah, before the sand goes in. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. So let me pull this out. And then... Oops, sorry. Yep. Yeah. 
So just, I, just thought I'd mention as well, you can buy a socked ag line or a socked drainage line. Um, if someone, if people are going to make a lot of these, it does make it a little bit easier. There's a sock over the top of the perforated pipe and it's designed that way uh, for landscaping and drainage work so they don't fill up with sand. So uh, I think the work, I worked out here, it was cheaper than buying weed mat and the slotted. So just something to think about. Yeah, and and that's another thing too. Is, is Rob, anytime you have a suggestion, bring it up as an alternate method, um, and we'll definitely, you know, we'll talk about that. But you can do this multiple ways, and you can use different exactly. different items for your water reservoir, and and so uh, think outside the box. In other words, yeah, yeah, for sure. I've seen people use bread crates. <laughs> bread crates. That's pretty awesome. Bread crates. There's, there's an awesome um, guy in America, J.T. Turner, I think is his name. I found him through a backyard aquaponics forum. Um, he's got massive wicking beds and he's using bread trays and um, drink crates, wrapping them in geotextile, and there is reservoir cells down the bottom. Really? That's quite interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, so now we have this covered up and we need to put in an upright, right, to be able to fill the water? That's correct. Okay. So what we did there was was we cut a a slit down here in the in the drain tile. Yeah. So the pipe could slide down in it. And now, um, at your recommendation, you recommend tying this thing to the to the tub, correct? Uh, yeah, because I've had uh, children pull them out. <laughs> <laughs> and what happens when you have that happen? Um, you can't then, get it back. <laughs> yeah, it's very tricky to get back in. So, so what we're going to do then is uh, drill two holes on both sides of that pipe. And uh, since we don't have any zip ties, we're going to use just some string and wrap it around that uh, that upright or the stand pipe. Um, and I thought maybe we could cut a groove in the back side of this thing right here to keep that uh, string from slipping down it and keep the kids from pulling it out. You think that would that's work? A great idea. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. It's the same principle. Um, that's okay. Do we have anything? Anybody in the audience right now that's uh, bringing anything up that we need to talk about? Um, they're just giving me praise for my camera work because I finally figured it <laughs> out. Um, no, not really. We've got. Um, Sleeks rule, sleek yeah. steak rule. Um, yeah. hey, do you know those guys? Oh, they yeah. are. They're Rob Bob. They're giving you the Aquaponics Hero Award. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. And, and we've uh, got a lot of desert dweller talking. Um, I don't know if you guys can talk about that in regards to the. Uh, We've got Cheryl Lose out here that lives in Vegas, and I'm sure, you know, in our dry climate, I'm living in Taos, New Mexico. Cheryl is uh, in there with uh, Utah, so there's a lot of desert folks sitting out there wondering how to keep their flowers pretty. Yeah, Rob, if you wanted to talk about that for a little bit more, that's fine. I mean, uh, you live in more of a desert, desert than either one of us do. Uh, it's it's more subtropical. Uh, when when we get rain, we really get rain. But yeah, for many years we we go without it. We're getting a um, weather pattern through at the moment uh, where we I think it's 18 months uh, below average rainfall. So yeah, it's it, at times here it can get rather dry. Um, it's the water restrictions that really bite when the um, the dams run start to run low. But yeah, other than that, if we had rainwater tanks on the house, I think we could. Pretty much well, which is very common over here. Um, I, we could pretty much well run the gardens just with the rainwater we collect. Uh, yeah. I don't know what the average rainfall is like in um, uh, in those areas over there. I, I have I've got a friend here coming around today actually. Um, she's from Arizona, and she said they basically had zero where she was living. So yeah. How much rain do we get here? Uh, it's it it rain once a week here. Pretty much, uh, except for the hottest part of summer, it might rain once a month. But uh, that's why wicking beds work so good here. I don't ever have to water them, you know, because the rain will just get whatever it needs. So, but it, uh, even during the dry spots, when it goes a month, and 
two months without any good rain, then uh, they don't ever go. So they're they're awesome. But uh, Rob, uh, I have the little grommets, you know, the for the drainage of of the water we put in there. But uh, you can walk. We're yeah. going to use the main camera here. Take a look at it just so people know what they're. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I'm not going to use this method right here, but could you explain, you know, kind of without uh, visual, <laughs> this is the two <laughs> L that go through there, and then, but I'm going to drill drill some holes in about uh, about four inches above the the bottom so that they, it'll drain out. It'll fill up right that that high, and then it'll drain out. So yeah. why you do yeah. Yeah, with, with um, the barrels that I make up, I use a little, um, they're a half inch grommet, 13 mil grommet, um, drill a 16 mil hole, I don't know what that is in Imperial, sorry, and these little rub, rubber grommet, grommets just push in from the inside, and then I get a little half inch irrigation fitting, wrap some shake cloth over the end, zip tie, I'll tie that on, and push it in from the inside. Sorry I got my visuals, guys, I should have prepared a bit better, um, but... What the reason I do that is uh, it allows a free flow of water. Um, we, when we get rain, we can really get rain. We can get anywhere up to um, uh, we've had four inches or what's that, 100 mil in a couple of hours, which floods the barrels out and the gardens as well. Um, so I like a nice, a nice, well-drained barrel so they don't flood out and we don't end up with problems with drainage and yeah, anaerobic bacteria setting up shop in the um, organic matter in the soil. So, yeah. I hope that made sense. <laughs> I need more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's fine, and and it did make sense. Um, uh, I, I'm interested to hear if uh, anybody else in the audience has ever tried this. Um, I know I made on my personal channel. I, I made a, a a small like a mini wicking bed, and you can take these things and scale them uh, at any size you want. I made one that would have would fit. In a windowsill, and you could grow. I'm growing a, a purple top turnip in it right now, but um, you know, for you, you're using the IBCs, and then didn't you start with something even a little larger than that when you first started? Um, our biggest bed is six meters by one, so it was six yards by one yard, roughly long. So you can make. I've seen larger ones again. Um, yeah, so it's. We have a few issues with some of the earlier builds. Uh, that that ag line that you're using in um, the barrel there, uh -huh. I used a single run of that down the centre of the bed and covered it with sand. So they don't hold as much water as they could. I probably, knowing what I know now, I'd probably loop it around three or four times so that you've got that you know bulk void for the water to sit in. The sand does hold water, but nowhere near as much as void. So okay. Yeah. Alright, good. So what's the next step now? We have drain holes drilled. We've got three of them dr uh, drilled around the bucket at four inches high. We've got our, yeah. you know, we've got ready for sand, right? Yeah, ready for sand. Okay, cool. <clears throat> and uh, with, with you, the, go ahead. Yeah, with with the sand on mine, I like them to sit uh, for the sand to sit about two inches above the drainage holes. Uh, around the sides in particular because I do find that the sand does settle and it'll go down around the side of your um, the donut there, I found with the donut ones in particular, and it will settle down, which means that you end up with um, soil sitting down in water all the time if the barrels are kept full. And I have I know other people haven't had problems with it, but I've had, um, might have been the compost mix we use, I've had a couple of barrels go anaerobic and we could actually smell them from quite a few metres away. So I like to keep the sand level high so no soil sits down the bottom. So, gotcha. So as long as you Rob, have, uh, yeah, go ahead, Tracy. I just want to pop in here because Blake Kirby is asking, um, Rob, you're talking about flooding the beds. Have I missed something? Don't you have to put an overflow at the height that you want the water to sit in? So that's the grommet. Can you yeah, that's, address that's that for us? Yeah, that's the holes Daniel drilled at four inches high around the base. And that's what the grommets are. They, um, the height you set it is is pretty much all up to you. Um, I like my reservoirs to be that uh, four inches or 100 mil is the shallowest because that's how big the pipe is. But I have got them up anywhere up to um, 200 mil or what's that, eight inches. So um, that's your overflow. 
that, that's basically your overflow for um, large rain events or just to make sure that um, when you're filling the barrel, you know you're not overfilling the barrel and the water's coming out. Right. Okay. Good question, Blake. Thank you. Hey, Blake. Um, so as far as what we're doing now, we've got the sand in there. We have a little bit more of a divot in the middle, and the, high, the sides are a little higher with sand. I don't know if you guys can see that in camera one, Tracy, but uh, I hope, uh, hope you can, and we're ready to add straw, I believe. It's framed up perfect, Wayne. Keep going. Looks good to me. Okay, good. So now we're adding, uh, we have some uh, wheat straw, and uh, and how much do we need to add in there, Rob? Um, I fairly loosely packed. I go around about um, four inches, uh, even more. Um, the soil's going to sit down on it um, and, and basically compress it further and further. So, yeah, go, go to town on it. Okay. All right. Hey, Rob, will you hold this one? <laughs> yeah, no problem, mate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So hey, now while you're while you're adding, um, I just I, I have a feeling all these people are friends of yours, Wayne. Do you know Alabama a great organic gardening guy? Yeah, that's Clay. Uh huh. Well, um, Clay apparently is sitting over in the side in a dunce chair because Blake told him to come up front, and so Blake just said back to him. Take that cone hat off. You don't need it. You're just misunderstood. <laughs> anyway, they're having fun out there. I just wanted to let you know that your boys are watching and they're having fun. we got a good group of friends on YouTube. We all have a lot of fun together, and, and we're all kind of a part of that. So we're, we're happy to be here. I missed okay. all that. I just dropped out. <laughs> Sounded funny. Oh, gotcha. So are you back now? Everything's good with you? Yeah, I think I'm here. Okay, okay. I got you. Um, so now what? Dirt? Yes. Soil. Yep. Um, soil mix. I like a, a nice, a nice heavy organic mix, um, mainly because the organics like to wick the water up. Uh, will wick water up a lot easier. Okay. So that's a that's good black. <laughs> black gold. Black gold. Yeah. So th this uh, this soil mixes. Can we talk about it a little bit? Uh, 20-year-old composted sawdust. And, uh, if we look worms. in it, every, as I move it around, it's just full of worms and uh, big giant earthworms and red wigglers. And, uh, and it really is the best soil I've ever used. I don't know what camera you guys are looking at, but that's some pretty good soil. Uh, haven't you put this in your greenhouse? Yes. The way I understand, I'll, I'll correct me if I'm wrong while you're shoveling there, but um, this is the same soil that he makes little tea bags out of. Um, I don't know what camera, if you can see my camera. It looks like we're, we lost it. Nope, I've, I've got, it, they're both working, so you okay. talk into Wayne right now, Wayne. Yeah, so there's uh, little little tea bags about that tall and about that big around with made out of a nylon stocking and um, let that soak for 24 hours with an aerator in 55 gallons of water and use that to water the greenhouse and that's the only fertilizer they use in their whole greenhouse yeah. and they've got plants bigger than anybody else around here so I'm, I'm telling you this stuff is good it's good yeah, good dirt plenty of worms in there <laughs> this is loaded up so. cover him back up in so there so do you, do you find that um, Rob maybe you can talk a little bit about worms in wicking beds and um, how they populate and do they ever get to a point where they start to die off and how's that all work? I've, I've had um, I've had a couple of barrels that are in the full sun uh, start out with worms, start out with loads of um, horse manure and mulch and organic matter in the soil which is the, the worms for people, um, some people get a bit confused here, worms actually eat or compost worms, the majority of their food is actually microorganisms, fungi, bacteria, and things like that. So as the organic matter rots and compost down, that's what the worms are actually feeding on. So that's why I like to add a lot of um, into the barrels and beds. Um, um, some of the barrels have been in full sun, and I think I pretty much will just cook them. The plants haven't done that good. Um, the, the worms have pretty much all died out. Other beds, I've gone the other way. Um, 
some of the IBCs out the front, I added in too much mushroom compost and horse manure, and they basically turned into massive worm farms, which is fantastic because I can I can pull worms out of them, but plants don't seem to like to grow in that environment for whatever reason. Um, I've tried growing in straight castings before, and the plants always do better in about, um, I'd say about a 40 40 uh, 40 percent castings and about 60 percent soil or compost mix. I don't know what it is. Um, I have I have seen other people recommend 20 percent castings and 80 percent um, soil. So okay. yeah, that's uh, I, I'm more like you. I'm yeah, more I'm, like a 40, 60, 50, 50 kind of thing myself. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because the bed was flying along. I noticed the bed was flying along, and then the, the level started to drop, and the worm population started to increase, and the ginger just stalled. It just stopped growing. So I think that was the reason why. Okay. All right. So now where are we at uh, with this? Are we done? Yes, we're done. Uh, putting one of my graphs in here, Rob. I know you're going to start grafting here real soon, aren't you? <laughs> oh, I hope so. Oh, then show us that again, because we are still looking at the bucket. So now come over to Wayne. Come to Wayne's camera. Okay. If you can get a. So what kind of graft is that? Tell it's, everybody. This about is it. a suix graft. It's on top. It's an heirloom uh, big tomato. On the bottom is a supernatural rootstock, and I just cut them off and then put the the heirloom on top, and it makes my plants disease resistant. You know, and uh, but you. Plant them on the same root line. You can't bury them deep. That's the only problem with uh, grafts. You have to bury them the same root line. So, so in other words, you don't get all the added roots or the added root system. Yep. Gotcha. Hey Dan, um, yes. twist around a little bit. We have a little too much of your back end and not enough of the pot. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Just <Chris. say. laughs> yeah. So. Uh, We've got one of them completed, and how much do you expect that to settle, Rob? Maybe about four inches, and and uh, put yeah, I'd, I'd say anywhere up to about there, yeah. And then uh, you always put all kinds of mulch on top, right? Certainly do. Yep, I whack a bit more um, sugarcane mulch on top, or um, I like to use uh, horse manure that I run over, dried horse manure I run over with the lawnmower as well. Okay. And then sugarcane mulch on top of that. So it just depends on how much of a lip you've got on the barrel, really, to what it'll hold. Because as soon as it rains, if it's too high, it's just going to wash off. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I think this will be good, um, and we're going to save this straw for this build here. We're going to do another build um, to showcase that you know, we can we can use different materials. And uh, we're going to do a hybrid system. We're going to try using a small section of pipe as a water reservoir and then we're also going to add in some rotten wood to act as a sponge and the rotten wood is sitting there to the left of the barrel that Dan's holding Tracy yes. um, if you can see that in the camera that rotten wood will act as a sponge I guess I'll just let Dan talk about it more pull it down a little bit Dan towards the wheelbarrow there you go okay so that's rotten wood wrapped with uh, mesh with the uh, yeah, let, let's back up. That is a tile, a piece of tile with a standpipe for filling that tile that's a water reservoir. But instead of using a round, uh, making the water reservoir cover the whole bottom, we're actually going to put wood on both sides of that water reservoir, and this rotten wood will act as a sponge. Dan's been doing this for a while. I think maybe he's got some good things to say about it. Well, yeah, this, uh, this, the, the rotten wood that I use is, is just about dirt. It's just just about a sponge, you know, it's just something you break up easy with your hands. And uh, this is actually was Wayne's idea of, of doing the hybrid, which I think is a real good idea because now it'll fill up uh, an empty space and it'll be more like a sponge. And I just like this because it becomes like a sponge in there and eventually it'll be dirt. And uh, the worms love this, so they'll go down there at the bottom, get a nice little snack. And, uh, Okay, while he's filling that up, we've got a question for Rob. Let me pull it up and find it again. Hold on one second. It is 
Uh, from She Stakes Rule, Rob, are there jades the fastest growing allowed in AU? Um, Barramundi, or sea bass, I think everyone else calls them. Um, I think they're the fastest in trout, the rainbow trout that they use down in the cooler areas down south. Um, they're the fastest. The jade perch, they're a tropical fish just west of here. Uh, there's a river system, the Baku River system. And the jade perch are actually native to that, so that's why we use them here. Um, I think tilapia, uh, even faster again, but that's a bit of a bad word to use in Australia. They're a feral pest, like cane toads. So, yeah, we, we can't use those fellas, unfortunately. We just have to catch them from the river. So, But the, the, um, the other fish we've got are silver perch, and they're relative or related loosely to the jade perch. Um, but they, they take anywhere up to about 18 months, 12 to 18 months to grow out, so a little bit longer, actually. I think they're um, in cooler areas a bit longer again. So there you go. Okay. Good. Question okay. uh, Do we have any other questions you want to bring up? Um, we actually just have some really funny stuff going on um, in here. Uh, Cheryl Deuce just said she's learning a lot about the grafting, and um, on the other show, this is intriguing. And Layla Martin says, a little too much at the back end, ha ha. And <laughs> Alabama Organic Gardening uploaded the back end to a PG 13. So, <laughs> and then Cheryl Deuce is glad for this total, as she's a total newbie. Um, what are the benefits and the problems you might run into? Is the question Cheryl asked? Okay. If uh, what what time do we have uh, so far? How much time? We're at two thirty-seven. You're thirty-seven minutes into the show, Wayne. Okay. So let's go ahead and answer that question real quick, Rob. Uh, maybe some of the benefits and some of the negatives since uh, for a newbie. Yeah, the the benefits is the amount of watering you don't have to do. Um, that was the big thing that got me into it. Uh, also, too, having having um, an active environment in there for the worms to produce uh, fertilizer for your plants on site, um, feeding up your plants and up the soil. Uh, the the worst thing, um, probably, the, there's two that stick out for me. One is I've had a captive um, root knot nematode in our beds. Uh, very hard to control, and because they're in such a small area, they, they really hammer your plants. Um, but that, that's an environmental thing. depends on where you are, whether the soil's contaminated. It's not going to happen to everyone. And the, the second one is the, the barrels that went anaerobic. Um, they started stinking out, uh, it putrefies down the base, and the plants pretty much all started yellowing and dying off straight away. It was something I noticed, you know. Plus, the smell wasn't too pleasant for the neighbours. Uh, but other than that, I really can't think of many, um, any downside other than I actually, um, I suppose, in a larger wicking bed, um, if they do dry out, um, there is always that chance if you forget to water um, or don't have someone who can, you know, water them while you're away on holidays, because they're basically a large pot, they will and can dry out. Whereas if you, your plants are in the soil, you know, there's always water in the in subterranean levels that the plants could always reach, you would hope, so if that makes yeah. Sure, and then just to go back and clarify one thing, um, as far yeah. as the water going anaerobic, the way that that happens is if the dirt is below the top of the water level, is that kind of how you would describe it? Yeah, um, if it's sitting in there constantly. Some people actually use soil in their reservoirs, but how they work it is they'll fill it up and then they'll let it go dry. So that soil is getting hydrated then drying out, hydrated and drying out. Some of the trench wicking methods um, uh -huh. use that. When they trench, they actually make a, a section in between their fruit trees so the roots can then find it. Um, that's basically soil lined in plastic um, with wood thrown in, wood chips as well thrown in. Um, that fills up, hydrates, the plants suck it dry, but because the plant has access, the roots have access to other soil with other water, um, the trees, you know, they, they don't sure. die out. So it's just an added benefit that they can be well irrigated, I suppose. So, yeah. Okay, got it. All right. But, um, yeah, the wood chips I'm as well. I, I know a few. Sorry. I was going to say, I was going to pop in. Um, Deanna Lynn Allen Rogers says, 
when do we add the worms to our wicking garden? <clears throat> Great question. What do you say, Rob? Um, I, I add them in with the worm castings we use when we make them up or the compost. Uh, or I just throw a handful in. Um, there's been a couple of beds as I make them new. I've had no compost or castings with worms in them. I just grab a handful out of one of the bathtubs, um, bathtub farms, and um, just throw them basically in the garden, just under a nice big pile of poop on the surface. So, yeah. For those of you that don't know you, you might clarify that bathtub's not in the house, right? <laughs> no, no, no. I got, I got a couple of bathtub worm farms underneath the house. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, so now we're, we're ready. We've got some wood in this tub. Um, if we can go look at camera one, uh, we've got the wood in the tub. It's leveled up, and I think we're just ready to put down some sand, right? Some aggregate. Yes. Yeah. This. Yeah. This. Uh, this is a, a. It's more of a, a rock sand. I, I get it out of the ditches and I sift it out. The uh, clay and minerals and all that kind of stuff in it. It's just a, a cheaper way if you can't go out and, and buy a ton of sand, then you can just go to the close ditch and dig it out and sift it, and then you got a, a bucket full of sand. Okay, Dan, will you pull that over close to the wheelbarrow so camera one can get on top of it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So, yeah. I don't know if you can see that at all or not. Yeah. No, it, it, we can see it now, yeah. We can't see inside of the bucket you're building anymore, though, Wayne. Yeah, uh, I'm going to carry the camera over there. Okay. Hold on, we're moving. Watch out for that shovel. <laughs> <laughs> you just see that. We'll need Delilah back for some instant first aid if you thwack your head with a shovel. All yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this basically is the same process then once we get to this point. Um, there's really nothing else to do but uh, add our straw in the dirt. Yeah. So, Rob, while they're adding straw and dirt, can you explain a little bit? We know the wood on the bottom is to kind of allow for a place for the water to sit, and then the sand, and then the straw, and then the dirt. Can you explain what those different levels do um, for the plants? Um, pretty much, well, uh, it's it's all up to the um, the reservoir, the bottom layer. I mean, that that sand looks chunky. It looks like it's like um, Daniel said, full of minerals and goodies as well. So in in that one, I'd see the roots coming down and actually feeding from that sand. But yeah, but basically, the um, the soil is going to hold the plant. And then you've got that that straw level that's going to be feed for the worms and a divider from uh, stopping the soil going down into the sand. But that that's only when the the barrels are first made as well. As soon as it compresses down and mats down, um, no soil's going to transfer down um, into the sand layer. And then yeah, so another worm. Um, besides the the added advantage of of lighter watering. Um, which I wanted to ask how often you you do have to water these, but for the plant itself, as opposed to being in dirt on the ground, it, yeah. it, it has better aeration, so it'll grow faster. What have you found the, the production rate versus um, planting a tomato in the ground and a tomato in one of these? Um, don't ask me about tomatoes. Um, okay, other I'm plants, sorry. Though. <laughs> okay. Other plants, so chilies are a good one. Oh, peppers. Um, I've I've found they actually grow a lot better in the smaller barrels than they do in the garden bed. Um, the, they grow larger. I think it's mainly because they're in there by themselves. So they got you know a good 50, 60 liters of soil compost all to themselves. They got water on tap, which is a big thing for plants. If they've got water and they've got the nutrients, they can continue to feed, transform, and basically grow and fruit for you. Um, I had a point and I've lost it. Um, I, I'm you know, I'm I'm coffee, I'll, go to, I'll go to the comment tracker. We've got uh, Jerry Parker is uploading some fantastic pictures. They look like beds he's made. So, do you know Jerry Wayne? Uh, you said Jerry Parker? Yes, sir. 
I do not personally know, but I'm I'm very excited to hear about that, and I'd like to know more about them. <laughs> yeah, well, um, Jerry, thank you very much, and and after the show, uh, Wayne will get in there and look at them and and do some commenting and all of that, and. Uh, and, and same to you, Rob. Feel free to pitch in after the show as well. Not a problem. Okay, right. so what's next, gentlemen? So uh, we are done building these wicking beds. Um, and we just showcased two different methods for doing it. And we used materials that we had laying around. We didn't go out and buy anything. And... Um, we and Rob's given you plenty of ideas on how you might uh, use some alternate methods as well, uh, more than what we've done here. Um, I don't have a lot more to add to this. It's a fairly simple process, but we wanted to bring this to the mass market, so to speak, and let everybody else know that there's other methods of gardening. It's not just tilling up your garden and uh, planting in native soil. There's better ways to do things nowadays, and this is one of them. Um, I, I did want to get to what Rob had to say about the teardown, the cleanup, and the prep for the next season when it comes to working with wicking beds. I'd like to hear your advice on that, Rob. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't do it. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't clean. I have cleaned some barrels out. Um, I've cleaned uh, sweet, uh, the sweet potato ones and the, the normal potato ones I clean out a fair bit. Um, after the season because you don't want surprises coming up under your chili. Um, but wh when I have pulled them down, uh, I think the, the worst one was a, um eggplant and the sand was just basically chockers with roots, which really isn't a problem because the compost worms in there are going to find that organic matter and they're going to polish it off. It's not like you've got a clump of um, cow manure or horse manure sitting in water with bacteria in that. Nice clean roots. Um, they're not going to go anaerobic and all stanky on you. Um, the one thing I do do is I like to take about a third of the soil out though and replace it with a worm casting blend um, of more so, uh, worm cast. It's what I've got on hand. So normally it's um, worm casting and some fresh soil, um, or it'll be compost if I'm lucky enough to make decent compost. Um, that'll get mixed in there as well. Throw that back in there, and that just um, re revitalizes the beds. Also, two worms. Um, like I mentioned before, we've had some barrels where the worms have just disappeared. I think my theory is it just got too hot for them. Um, I like to boost the worm population in them. I find that a lot of the castings I throw in have cocoons, so it happens naturally. But yeah, if I if I'm not happy with the level I've seen when I dig through, I grab a handful out of the bathtub and throw them in there, and away they go. So. But always make sure I add a lot enough organic matter to compost down for the bacteria and then for the worms to feed on. So, okay. Um, yeah. What I was going to say before was um, I remembered uh, the the one one of the um, big benefits with the the water is you can grow rather large plants. We've actually got a pawpaw growing in an air pruning barrel that I made up. Um, not the most successful pawpaw tree I've seen. I think that's to do with the nutrients I've got in there. But you can actually grow rather large plants in these things as long as you can keep the water up to them. So I like yeah. your little air printing pots, by the way, as well, Wayne. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, they're small and they're simple. And um, But yeah. I took that idea from you. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I was curious to know uh, how your pawpaw was doing, so it's it's good to hear that. The, yeah, the tree's the tree's going fine. I don't know if we've got a pollination problem with the flowers or whether it's a um, a nutrient deficiency in the soil. But I'm thinking about uh, taking it out and planting it in the aquaponics on the rebuild. So sure. we'll see what happens there. So ultimately, if we were to, to say, well, let's make uh, air wicking pots, we could technically just go and drill a bunch of holes around this, cover up the those holes with uh, some shade cloth, and we would have yeah. a wick pot that is also an air pruning pot, right? Yeah, yeah. There would be some roots that um, would go down into the reservoir, but I, I don't think, you know, the, you, you want the air pruning action at the top where the roots are going to just wrap around and around and around. So, sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's all we have today. Um, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> we, we, we got a little uh, view from the crowd here. If you don't mind me popping in some stuff that's going on out there, Wayne. Yeah, I was getting ready to hand it back to you. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were getting ready to say goodbye. <laughs> Not yet. Um, Alabama Organic <laughs> Gardening says, uh, this really makes me feel confident about about venturing out to the wiki bed world. I feel like I could make one of these in an afternoon. Yay! So well, we, if they if they get stuck when they get home, is there a place for them to see besides watching this again? Um, is there a place for them to see? Do you have some of this on your uh, World for Change YouTube, Wayne? Uh, the wicking beds. Uh huh. Uh, no, this is the only one on World for Change with wicking beds. I have a, a, a small D, a DIY mini wicking bed system that's on my personal YouTube channel. I'll put a link to that, but I think the the uh, more the authority, it would be Rob. And Rob has a lot of, of videos on wicking beds, different styles. And, and, um, so that's what I, I think uh, you should do is go to his channel. If he can put some links below in the comments, then that's what you need to do. Yeah, okay. yeah I'm then, just putting a link down here to another guy that I've just recently met. He's come okay. out and met us. Um, he's, he's started to do wicking wicking um, in very, very small containers. So, yeah, he's, he's trying all manner of things. So uh, His name's Forex and More, I think, on YouTube. Okay. okay. Yep. So as long as you share everything, that uh, the knowledge that you have, then that really gives us good... Um, Good information to share with our viewers, and, and I'm really happy that we've had this show. Tracy, what else do we have? Um, Rob, are your larger beds easier for you to manage, you know, keeping track of temp and fertility, etc.? Um, my preferred size now would have to be the IBCs. Um, the large beds are fantastic. Like I said earlier, I, I didn't know enough, and I don't think I've built them as well as I could have. Um, but the I, the new IBC beds, they're just flogging along. Um, they're, they're holding a lot more water, um, throwing in the... Uh, now the, I think I've got the soil down pat with uh, compost, mushroom compost, horse manure and soil. Um, yeah, they're, they're staying nice and rich. The worms are reproducing. I'm finding cocoons in there. The, the soil has settled a lot, which is good um, because it means I can keep adding more organic matter in there for the worms to feed on. So, yeah... Um, the medium-sized ones are my preferred size now, and yeah, so. Okay, one more from Michael Rawlings. I'm wondering if there is a way to set up your wicking bed with a float so they can auto-water themselves. Has anybody tried that? I'm nope. about to. <laughs> <laughs> yep, um, I would say uh, one person to go and follow if you're wanting to learn more about that would be Larry Hall. Larry um, Hall. Yeah. Um, do you know who Larry Hall is, Rob? Certainly do. Uh, the rain gutter grow system. Fantastic idea. It's it's sort of like an expansion of the net pot um, hydroponics, uh, where yep. you've got a net pot sitting in water, uh, except he's expanded it by he's connected a, a bucket or a grow bag on top of that net pot, so the water is um, soaking up through the net pot into the soil, and you've basically got a constant, constant... Um, uh, um, water availability for the plants. Uh, Mart Hale, check out his killer system. Uh, he's got he's got it all. Uh, he's got um, air printing wicking pots set up on the road, uh, a buried gutter system, and he runs water from a pond with fish through it. So it's an aquaponic air pruning wicking rain gutter grow system. Right. <laughs> Which is something I'd like to try here. So. Yeah, yeah. I'll, if I can find a link to his video or his channel, I'll, I'll pop it up. Uh, Mark's a great guy. He's, he's yeah. on to a few different bits and pieces as well, like the rest of us. So, yeah. Okay. All right. And and that's one of the reasons why we have a pond right here. It's, yes. it's to be able to utilize that uh, yes. on the homestead. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. That's, that's the pond I was asking you about, Rob Bob. Would it work for uh, aquaponics? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you need it. Yeah. Well, it's a big one. <laughs> what, what sort of fish have you got? What what sort of fish would you be running in there? Catfish or? Uh, no, they're not catfish. They're actually uh, I got uh, ten tilapia in there about this big. So, and, oh, sweet, cool. Uh, uh, they've just been recently been introduced in there, so but they they're they're in there somewhere. We don't see them much, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can you can turn that into aquaponics. I've seen ponds turned into aquaponics. There's a guy out in uh, Northern Territory. 
um, I think he's around Alice, and he, he runs his aquaponics from a pond, one of the first guys I saw. And, um, yeah, he just runs it up into, I think he's got um, um, flood and drain beds and a couple of raft or NFT, and then comes back down to the pond and just recirculates that way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Good. Um, I think we, we've had a lot of good questions. Uh, how much time do we have left, Tracy? Um, we've got about five minutes left, and that is the end of the questions besides some just fun to get in there and play with. But that's that's all the pertinent, pertinent questions why we had Rob in the room. Okay, good. And I just want to thank all of the audience for coming to the show today. And if you're in the audience and felt like you were Bible, please remember to share it with your friends. Um, that way somebody else can be benefited from the effort that, that those of us that have produced it and Rob Bob being a guest, um, has put forth, and it would really be valuable for uh, others, I think, to be able to get this information. So um, I want to thank you, and Rob, I, I would just want to turn it over to you if there's any last words you'd like to say and, and how people can get in touch with you, then I'll let you refresh them, and then uh, we'll close everything out. Yep. Yeah, um, well, if you want to get in touch with us, um, being Bob01 is our YouTube channel, or Rob Bob. Uh, we've got bits out the back on Facebook. I've got a G Plus account, but um, I, I don't really know how to use G Plus that much, as you can probably tell. Um, so you can contact us through there. Ask any questions, as long as they're polite. Um, ask any questions, and yeah, I'm happy to answer them, as long as I've got the time. I do get back to everyone. It just takes me a while sometimes. Also, I wanted to mention Colin Austin's website. I'm going to put a link up. I mean... This guy's the guru, he's the man, he's the guy who came up with this idea and popularized it, so I reckon, you know, it's well worth going back to the source and sussing him out. Um, he's got a couple of links on there. There's a couple of other great people I'm going to throw links up there as well. Um, I'll do Mark Hale, I'll throw in Forex and more up, um, just just to give you different ideas, because, like, you know, Daniel's wood idea sort of came out from the left field, left of field, and I went, that's, that's awesome. And then I stumbled across a woman in Western Australia, and she uses wood chips. She uses um, dried out wood chips as her um, substrate, so or yeah, her, her medium down in the reservoir. So yeah. So uh, you know, I think that's pretty much. Well. Thanks for watching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you, and I really appreciate you being on, Rob. It, it just means a lot to us, and uh, we know that that it's going to be valuable to others. Anything you'd like to say, Dan? Well, yeah. if you want to see the Hugo Culture Pots, that's what I call them, Hugo Culture Pots. Uh, on my my channel, it's Go for Green Living. Uh, su subscribe if you like. Uh, uh, but I'll, if you want to come down and help, uh, I'm sure Wayne can tell you there's plenty of work to be done. You're more than welcome to come here, and I'll show you everything I know about uh, homesteading. That's right. So over the last uh, couple of weeks, thank you, Dan. Over the last couple of weeks, um, I've been down here. We've been doing life classes. We've learned how to mix cob in multiple different ways. We've all learned how to apply different types of cob to the house. Um, we've done, uh, we've learned how to do tire wall foundation. We've talked about sustainability and you name it. And we've got uh, next week, we've got four greenhouse classes coming up and it's just to the right side of your screen there on the camera, but there's a greenhouse and um, we're going to do four classes, four different days and we're going to cover the basics through the advanced, all the way through cloning and propagation and, um, and grafting. So we'll show you how to make potatoes like this that we use. Um, other than that, make sure you check out our event page at worldforchange.com forward slash events and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's A World for Change TV. And uh, we just thank you for being here. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you, Tracy, for all the work that you've put into this show. And Thanks, you know, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. You're welcome. Goodbye, everybody. See you tomorrow. Have a good one.